All right, um, so we are on to our next topic, which is from Jody Turk and her team. And I think Jody, I saw her on the phone. Um, this is advanced thermal radiator for global lunar heat rejection. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I am Jody Turk uh, and I have been working with Carlos Gomez and Greg Schunk on a advanced thermal radiator for global lunar heat rejection. Uh, all three of us are out of Marshall Space Flight Center um, in the Thermal Analysis and Control Branch. Um, and I will be presenting uh, on our work for the three of us. So as I'm sure all of you know, uh, we are going back to the moon. Um, so Artemis is taking us back to the moon uh, for sustained um missions as well as to eventually establish a presence there permanently uh, so we need to come up with ways to help reject the amount of heat that we'll be creating for all latitudes uh, along the lunar surface um, as well as while we're orbiting uh, the moon so um, we have high infrared background radiation that comes from the lunar surface that can seriously compromise the performance of conventional thermal radiators we can see in that uh, Thermal desktop plot that we have over to the side, uh, we can exceed temperatures of 250 degrees Fahrenheit on portions of the moon. So we need to be able to reject heat even operating in these conditions. The Apollo missions uh, use consumable water for heat rejection, which was great for a short term mission, um, but it's not at, it does not work as well when we're talking longer term or permanently sustaining uh, a habitat on the moon or a vehicle on the moon. So part of the lunar radiative environment we need to consider is both the solar as well as the background radiation that we get from the lunar regolith. So conventional thermal radiator technology uses low solar absorption, solar absorption and high infrared emittance coatings um, on thermally conductive substrates. So typical radiators now have a silver Teflon um, on the surface and then an aluminum backing plate. So this works for most applications in space because we're able to emit that solar um, and not absorb at the same wavelengths. So, but when we add that equatorial or lunar surface in background radiation, we start to have issues which you can kind of see in this plot. Um, sorry, I see that I'm getting messages popping up. So we have the solar um, normalized irradiance wave, which you can see the wavelength does not overlap much with our radiator, which is this blue line. But when we add that lunar regolith or planetary background radiation, we start having some overlaps. So where we're trying to emit energy, we're also absorbing. And so we want to try and avoid as much overlap as we can so our radiator has better performance. To do this, we have two proposed innovative radiators. The first one is a semi-transparent infrared absorber such as calcium fluoride with a silver backing. So that way we're trying to uh, transmit through that calcium fluoride uh, when we're emitting out and then reflect a lot of that solar and infrared radiation up to 10 microns. So you can kind of see in this image in the bottom left corner, we're really trying to emit that IR out um, and then reflect the solar off the silver and then any incident radiation that we have reflected off that calcium fluoride glow, reflect as much as we can off that calcium fluoride cover glass. So we um, can approximately expect to see 90% of that solar energy and 55% of that infrared energy um, transmitted and reflected through that calcium fluoride. Next um, was to add an additional cover glass or zinc selenide um, as a second uh, uh, reflector. So reflect more off that zinc selenide so we don't even get it to the calcium fluoride as well as that solar and then still be able to emit from the radiator out into space um, through both of those. So theoretically, we could get 70% of that high incident angular lunar radiation and 92% emitted um, out of our radiator. So we're trying to reflect and um, as much as we can while still allowing us to emit the heat from the vehicle or spacecraft that we're on um, through those cover glasses. 
So theoretically, we might be out with a sun directly overhead our radiators. We might be able to see ourselves rejecting two to three times as much as a conventional radiator, um, which we're going to be testing in this project. So another thing that we need to consider as we're going to the lunar surface is the topography of the, the lunar surface. So the lunar surface has a lot of different craters and mountains. And so we need to take into account how much of the lunar surface we're going to be seeing if, say, we are in a lunar crater. Uh, there is a database that has all this information about different types of lunar craters, the mountains, the angle for the craters, um, derived from like the parent depth of the mountain or crater and the height and the radius of the feature. Through all this database, it's found that a lot of them fall into that 20 to 40 degree angle. And there's some margin applied to account for any tilt that you might have on your vehicle at the bottom of the crater or any rocks that you might be sitting on while you're in that vicinity of the lunar topology. So on the plot to the right hand side, we have some graphs um, showing a comparison of a conventional silver Teflon radiator to an in innovative calcium fluoride, and then the second innovative calcium fluoride with that zinc selenide cover glass. So this is showing our amount of heat flux in comparison to the lunar feature angle. So that's like how much of that uh, lunar surface you're going to be seeing from that center of the radiator. And we also have a direct solar load coming directly down on top of the radiator. So with our conventional silver Teflon radiator, we see that our performance degrades significantly when we have higher angles because we're not able to reject as much of that incident IR from the lunar surface. When we have the innovative calcium fluoride, we see a significant improvement on how much heat we're able to reject um, based on the calcium fluoride being able to reflect more of that incident IR. And then again, a more improvement with the calcium fluoride and zinc selenide cover glass. And this is also assuming that our radiator is operating around 50 degrees at the subsolar point, which is the hottest point on the lunar surface. So these are our three radiators uh, pictured. So we have our silver Teflon radiator, which we use silver Teflon tape um, and then adhered that to an aluminum backing. And then our calcium fluoride, which was a calcium fluoride glass with a silver coating on the back, which is why you can see that is very reflective. And then we adhered that to the same thickness aluminum backing as we have on the silver Teflon radiator. For the calcium fluoride radiator with zinc selenide cover glass, we use the same calcium fluoride radiator, but then attached a zinc selenide cover glass on top of that. Um, it did not actually touch the zinc selenide or the calcium fluoride glass, um, but we had a separate mounting structure to just held it in front of that calcium fluoride radiator. So for our test, we use the high intensity solar environment test chamber or high set. This uh, is a chamber that EM41, uh, bra uh, another branch at Marshall Space Flight Center has. Uh, we chose this chamber because it's liquid nitrogen cooled so it can simulate our space environment. But it also has a Xeon arc lamp that is able to provide a one solar load onto our radiator for the lunar shroud configuration. So we could simulate having that direct solar um, on the radiator as well as simulating as if it's in a crater. The other configuration we had was our orbital shroud configuration, which you can see here we had a disk and then our radiator sitting in front of that disk to simulate as if we were orbiting around um, the lunar surface. So here's a closer up view of some models that we drew up of the lunar shroud, the orbital shroud, as well as our radiator. So for each of these, we wanted to really try and isolate the shrouds as well as the radiator from the chamber as much as we could. So we had some bars that attached to the base of the chamber um, and we used some thermal isolators. Uh, for the shrouds, we had some ceramic isolators so that they could withstand the 120 C temperatures that we drove them to uh, and then had heaters and then able to center that solar load onto the radiator. 
For the orbital shroud, um, we again had some ceramic uh, standoffs uh, to help isolate that shroud so we weren't having to use as much heater power to heat the shrouds. For the radiator, we took extra care to really try and isolate as much as we could um, the radiator from the bars that we were using to hold them in place. So that way we were really measuring how much we were emitting through the front of the radiator and not any conductive or radiative heat losses through the back of the radiator. So we had some G10 and Teflon standoffs that we used to help isolate it. We also had a G10 ring that we attached a MLI blanket to. So that way we were trying to insulate that back of that radiator as much as possible. We had the same setup for the silver Teflon, calcium fluoride, and zinc selenide radiators with the addition of another Teflon standoff to hold that zinc selenide radiator, or sorry, cover glass in place um, for that portion of the experiment. So here's some more information on the lunar surface simulator for orbiting spacecraft or our orbital shot as I've been calling it. So this was a 23 inch diameter disc, which was positioned in front of the radiator to simulate a spacecraft orbiting at about a thousand kilometers above the lunar surface. We painted the orbital shroud uh, with a high emissivity coating, which is about 0.88 to simulate the lunar regolith. And we had heaters attached to the backside of this, which you can't see because there's the MLI blanket that we had to help try and reduce the amount of heater power we needed. And then um, attach that to a G10 ring uh, to help um, isolate that heat and really um, hold the heater wires and feed them through. Here you can see it in the chamber. So here is our LN2 shroud. And then we positioned in the center of the chamber the 23-inch disc and then our radiator in front of that. And then not only did we have thermocouples around the shroud to measure the temperature, but we also had an IR camera so that way we could see more of a distribution of what the temperature was across the shroud. Um, so we were on average about our 120 C um, on our shroud, which was that subsolar point uh, or the warmest point on the lunar surface. So we had our lunar crater simulator, which is similar um, in some of the design, uh, but this is our lunar shroud. So simulating as if we're on the lunar surface in a crater. So this was an 11 inch diameter disc or shroud, um, and it was used to simulate as if you were looking from the center of the radiator out to have a 30 degree angle. So as if we were in a crater that from the bottom to the top, you had a 30 degree angle. So you still got some incident IR from the lunar surface as well as that solar on the front of the radiator. So we use the same coating uh, to get to simulate the lunar regolith with an emissivity of 0.88 and um, heated this shroud to 120 C to simulate that subsolar point again. Uh, so for this one, we actually just rested the MLI blanket on top of the shroud. Um, as you can see in the chamber, this is it installed uh, with the radiator. And then we had the IR camera again. So we only could see half of the shroud in the chamber because you have the MLI blanket on the outside and due to where the porthole where we had the camera, uh, we couldn't see the whole shroud, but um, it was symmetrical on our heater layout. So it was nice to see, you know, that we were pretty even across our shroud on what temperature we were seeing. So uh, some in test information about the radiators and kind of what criteria we use for different cases. Uh, so for the orbital shroud case, um, where we're simulating us rotating around the lunar surface, we tested the silver Teflon, calcium fluoride, and um, zinc selenide. Uh, radiators. And for the lunar shroud configuration, we only ended up testing the uh, silver Teflon and calcium fluoride radiators, radiators because we found that the zinc selenide would actually absorb more solar than we were expecting uh, when we first uh, had the data on our experiment. So for the silver Teflon radiators, we tested at zero watt, half watt, and one watt of heat applied to the back. So we had a heater on the back of the radiator to simulate any internal heat that we're trying to reject. Um, and then we had our three thermocouples uh, attached to the back of the, each of the radiators. Uh, for the calcium fluoride and zinc selenide radiators, we only tested at zero and one watt due to time constraints because there's a lot more thermal mass adding that calcium fluoride and zinc selenide glass, so it just took longer for us to get to our steady state criteria. 
Um, we chose these heater powers. It seems low to have only have half a watt or one watt applied, but based on the size of our radiator, if you scaled it up to a hundred meter squared radiator, which is pretty typical for what you might see on a larger vehicle, we can reject up to 2,700 to 5,500 watts with a when we're directly facing the lunar surface. So we felt that this was a pretty good amount of heat to you know test out uh, how the zinc selenide and calcium fluoride compared to the silver Teflon radiator. Um, and again, we waited for each of these each at each of the power cases for the radiator to get to steady state where our steady state criteria was half a degree C change over an hour. And then once we saw that we dwelled for another hour. So I'm going to get into some results now. Um, so this is the first three cases that I'm presenting are with our orbital shroud. So that's where we're simulating as if we're on a spacecraft orbiting around the lunar surface. So we have our zero watt, half watt, and one watt case uh, for each of those three thermocouples that are on the silver Teflon radiator. And then with the orbital shroud uh, with the calcium fluoride radiator, we have our zero watt and one watt case. And then I'll have a table at the end to show you all these temperatures so you can compare them directly. And then this is our zinc selenide calcium fluoride radiator uh, at our zero and one watt case. So with the zero watt case, we had a little bit of a hiccup. Uh, of course, with testing, there's always a little bit of something. Um, so we had a forced restart on our computer. Um, so we weren't able to continue the tests seamlessly. Um, so there was a dropout where we had to switch to manual control of the heaters. Um, we weren't able to collect any thermocouple data, but we were monitoring um, with the IR camera to make sure that we weren't getting too hot on that orbital shroud. Um, and then we were able to pick up once we restarted and get to our steady state criteria and then continue on to the one watt case. So here's a table uh, comparing our different values. So uh, let's just look at the test values um, for each of the cases. Um, so we did see a significant improvement uh, when we had this silver Teflon, which is the AGFEP. Um, to the calcium fluoride. And then we saw a little bit more improvement on that zinc selenide radiator uh, when we added that extra cover glass. And then when we looked at the one watt case, uh, again, we saw a significant improvement to the calcium fluoride and then just a little bit better performance out of that zinc selenide. Um, so we also created a thermal desktop model uh, because part of this was not only just to test the calcium fluoride and zinc selenide performance in comparison to silver Teflon, but also to try and create a thermal desktop model that we can use in the future to help model what these radiators might, how they might perform and how they might react in different environments. Um, so we really wanted to take our test results and use them as a model correlation uh, to try and help us predict any future experiments or uh, designs that we may use in the future. So we were able to get pretty close on that zero watt case. Um, we have a little bit of a temperature difference and then a little bit more in that one watt case. Uh, some future work that we're still working on is fine tuning that model correlation because we found that, you know, what optics we had quoted online were not quite what we were delivered, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in our conclusions um, and some other effects that might have, you know, not had perfect results to from the test to the model and why we saw not as good a performance as we are expecting. The next uh, set of cases that I'm showing are with our lunar shroud. So where we had our crater simulator. So as if our radiator is sitting in a crater on the lunar surface. Uh, so this is our silver Teflon radiator at our zero half and one watt case. And with our three thermocouples on that radiator. And then this is our calcium fluoride radiator at that zero and one watt case. Sorry, that was quick. Okay, so then this is our comparison between those two cases. So the silver Teflon we actually found performed better than the calcium fluoride. So we had that solar load on, oops, sorry. We had that solar load on the front of the radiator as well as that incident IR coming from our shroud simulating the lunar surface um, and we found that uh, the calcium fluoride we had probably absorbed more solar than we were expecting, the, which comes into play where the optics that we quoted online were not exactly the optics that we got with our um, calcium fluoride that was delivered. So 
I'm going to go to our, and then our model correlation for this one, we were able to adjust um, the optical properties to actually what we measured instead of what we were quoted and get very close to the temperatures that we saw in the test. So in conclusion, um, for the orbital source, we were able to validate our theoretical predictions that we saw improved performance out of the calcium fluoride when we have the lunar environment with high background infrared loading and even see some modest improvements with that zinc selenide cover glass. Um, with the lunar shroud, however, um, we saw that the calcium fluoride did not perform as well under direct solar loading. So um, we, when we measured the calcium fluoride, we found that the, the test result or the measured values were a little bit lower than what were published online. So we didn't have the exact optical properties that we were hoping to get. Also um, at normal incidence, maybe the radiator window and cover glass would have performed a little, um, would reflect little solar radiation. So maybe we could have better performance with a more reflective coating, or if we have an off nominal incident angle, which we did not test, but could be a future test to see how it performs. Um, we also found that maybe using a different material, so we had pretty thick glass that we used. Um, let's go to, you can see it in this image. We had pretty thick calcium fluoride glass as well as zinc selenide glass. Um, so we think that maybe having a thinner coating might help um, due to our budget and what was available to us. We were only able to get the thicker cover glass, but maybe having a vapor deposited um, calcium fluoride or zinc selenide or have stacking layers of different optical properties, you could increase your performance because we believe that we did see some effects um, from the edge which would help in the orbital shroud because it was looking at the LN2 shroud. So it was some extra cooling that we got from the side where the lunar shroud had a direct view of 120 C. So it probably heated it up a little bit more. Um, so going forward, um, we have some more model correlation work to do to refine the process for analyzing semi-transparent optics. Uh, we found that it's a very different type of modeling. Um, you have to take some wavelength properties into account as well as potential edge effects. Um, so it's been a really interesting learning experience on how to do that model correlation. And then um, potential future experiments with alternative radiator configurations and or materials. So that's all that I have for today. Does anybody have any questions? Also, I would really like to thank uh, Carlos uh, Gomez and Greg Chunk, as well as the people in EM41 who all helped make these tests possible um, and really worked hard to get us in and help us with the testing uh, since we were doing this kind of right in the high time of COVID and it was hard to get on center. So with that, uh, any questions? Yeah. As that was really interesting and you kind of touched on what my, what was going to be my question is, you know, I could, it's kind of, I would guess that with all those layers of the, the glass and the um, calcium fluoride, I assumed it would be a lot heavier than just a, like the silver Teflon. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys can work on getting thinner materials because um, that was a, a pretty big significant drop in temperatures just by changing to that calcium fluoride configuration. Yes, yeah, and we really, um, we looked to try and find it, but to just do the vapor depositing, it was going to be extremely expensive. So we were like, okay, what do we have available? But that is something that we think would be really beneficial to look at in the future and kind of see what would happen um, if you had that thinner coating. Mm -hmm. um, another good question from um, Susan Jansen. Um, are either of the materials, the calcium fluoride or the zinc selenide, better performers in a lunar dust environment? So that was something that we did talk about um, potentially doing is to simulate as if it was coated in lunar dust. Um, however, we did not look at that for this specific experiment. Um, that was something that we were like, oh, it'd be really interesting to look at moving forward because um, Lunar dust does affect radiators, um, but that's not something we looked at in this one. Okay. Yeah, that would be good because yeah, if you start using it on the lunar surface, I know it's <laughs> immediately becomes an issue. Yes. <laughs> um, 
Someone else asked, in the radiator test that you mentioned on page 11, rejecting directly to the lunar surface, what was the effective lunar surface facing radiant background? Okay. Um, wait, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that one more time? Yeah, I'm trying to understand it too. Um, what was the effective lunar surface facing radiant background when you uh, assume that the 100 meter squared uh, radiating surface would reject um, you know, oh. the 5,500 watts? Gotcha. Um, this was as if it was looking at the uh, lunar background at the subsolar point, um, so that 120 C. Um, and looking at that lunar surface. Okay, gotcha, okay. Um, then we have one more question. What are the optics of the materials you use and how were the optics you got different from what was advertised? So I do have a plot um, that I don't have handy with me, um, but so we thought that we were going to I'll use this plot as an example so we thought that we had shifted this blue line over to the right hand side a little bit more um so that line was really like you know a little bit here and then we peaked more over here um so that way we did not have as much overlapping between the lunar surface ir what that was absorbing and what we were able to emit but it was actually more shifted this way um so we had uh i we had lower emissivity than we were expecting at lower wavelengths. Um, so we thought we were gonna have a little bit higher emissivity than what we actually measured. Um, <laughs> I can share that with you, Abby, um, and and send that to you on what we what we thought we were getting versus what we actually got.